One of the biggest problems with social media is that people only ever present their best. Their best vacations, their cutest fall sweaters, their totally posed but oh look at me it's just a candid shot that makes their booty look just so yeah. And us landscape photographers, myself included, we're no different. We only share our most striking compositions, our most stunning locations, and our most epic light. In other words, my fine fine audience, you only ever see my successful shots. Which means you might be wondering, hey, does that Crips guy ever take any bad photos? And the answer to that is, uh, yeah. A stupendous, unwieldy, bring out your dead cart full of bad photos. And in this video, I wanted to show you a few of those photos and talk through the times when I tried to make a photo happen, when I worked the scene as best as I could, but I just failed to get a good shot. I'm gonna discuss why I failed, as well as the lessons that you can take away to hopefully improve your photography the next time that you go out. I'd like to start by taking a look at some photos that I took really recently, just this year, 2020. So not going back to like 2006 when I just got started and going, well, these photos totally sucked because I was a beginner. No, this is stuff that I just took that I couldn't make a photo happen. So this was on a backpacking trip that I took with a friend when we hiked from a place called North Lake. And we got kind of a late start that day because of some road construction. And so by the time we reached camp, it was only about 20 minutes until the sunset. So we just threw our stuff on the ground and started running around trying to find good compositions. And at that time, the lens that I had on my camera was my wide angle lens. And so I was looking at the scene through a wide angle point of view. And there was a bit of nice light way off in the distance in the background, so I kept that as the background subject of my photo, and I spent my time frantically searching for some kind of a foreground to draw my viewer into the photograph. And this is really where I failed. Because you can see what's going on here with the first shot that I took, is I have this rocky foreground here, but what direction does it lead your eye? It creates a pathway off in this direction that leads to nowhere, and in fact, there's a huge visual gulf between this foreground and the background. This is where I want your eye to end up, but look at this, look at all the lines in the photo. There's a ridge line here that brings your eye down to this same nether point. Not to mention that ridge line and these trees, they all kind of blend together. So this is a bit of a no man's land here in the photograph. It makes it really a challenge to get your eye from the foreground into the background. Not to mention this particular foreground, honestly, it's not that engaging. It's just some stuff in the landscape. And this is the problem that I ran into this whole night as I was trying to shoot. So I kept moving back up the hillside farther and farther, trying to find some kind of interesting foreground object. And although I really like this huge rock right here, I'm running into a lot of the same problems, right? There's not a lot of connection between the foreground and the background. There's this break right here, it's really hard to get your eye to connect those two parts of the photograph. And, and this rock, even though it's kind of interesting, it doesn't stand out that well from the background. So I thought, well, maybe I can photograph it from the other side. Does it stand out better from this side? And it kind of does, but now we have even less of a pathway, even less of a continuation from the foreground through to the background. And the other thing that this composition did, which I found frustrating, is it brought this other mountain into the frame and it's kind of hiding behind this ridge line like that. And I don't like that. When I have something in my frame, I want it to be in my frame, not hiding behind something in the background. So I'm not in love with this composition either. I just kept moving back farther and farther up the mountain, trying to find other rocks. I mean, this is cool, it's impressive, it's in your face, but the amount of visual weight that I gave this rock compared to the background is totally disproportionate. This thing is ponderous and heavy within the frame and the background consequently is just this little nubbin of interest. It's a really disproportionate photo and it just doesn't work for me. So at this point, the sun is basically down, it's below the horizon here and I'm just 
getting really frustrated. I can't find any photos, and, and usually when I'm scouting, I don't have the camera on the tripod. I'm just handheld. I'm shooting, and, and when you are moving quickly like that, it's a lot more difficult to simply stumble across a composition that you like, and that's exactly what my problem was here. I just didn't have time to work the scene. Because we got to camp so late, there wasn't enough time to really scout and look for multiple compositions looking in multiple directions. So I ended up with this frenzied approach, which doesn't lend itself to good photography. Now, as I kept moving up higher and higher on this little plateau, some of those problems with the connection between the foreground and the background started to disappear a little bit. And that's basically because the midground started to flatten out. And so you can see here, I don't have those huge swath of dark trees preventing your eye from going from the foreground to the background. So that works a little bit better in some of these photos. But I have to say, I just don't find these foregrounds all that compelling. Again, they're just stuff in the landscape as opposed to something that I was really personally invested in. So as I kept moving around, I ultimately realized what these issues were. I, I wasn't finding a foreground that I was truly interested in, and my midgrounds, the way that this landscape kind of flowed downhill away from me, it made it really hard to connect the foreground and the midground to the background. And so what I ended up doing is turning my camera uh, 90 degrees the other direction over here to the left and getting farther over to the edge of the shelf here where I could actually see down into the valley and when I did that that's when I created what I think is the best photo that I was able to shoot that particular evening I have this nice foreground I love these little pines just right up in your face and as you can see here this midground, it for the foreground flows through the midground, and you can actually see the visual pathway going all the way, obviously, to this background element, a dominant background element with some nice bright light around it. So that's why this photograph is more successful than something like this initial one that I shot that has all of this midground preventing flow through the photograph. So that's what I'm enjoying about this image right here. And if I do a little bit of processing, it actually turns out to be kind of an okay photograph. It's not incredible, it's not gonna win any awards, but you can see how simply understanding those problems that I was facing enabled me to actually create an image that solves those problems and is better for it. Now you might be saying, well, what about that first photo? If you just did a little bit of processing to that, don't you think it would look good? Well, and the truth is, if I do the same processing to this first photograph, well, it might be a little bit more aesthetic at this point. You can see some more details, a bit more color, things like that. But it still has those same fundamental structural problems that make it fail as a photo, right? This visual pathway leads over here to no man's land. This stuff in the midground blocks the visual flow through the frame. And honestly, there's just not enough interest going on there in the background. So that's why I was struggling so much with this scene on this particular night. And when I realized and started to solve those problems, that's what helped me create a sort of a, a decent shot here. So the biggest mistakes that I really made in this particular scene and the takeaways that you guys can have is, I didn't give myself enough time to truly scout the area. So I didn't have a good sense for what the different elements were and the different kinds of shots that I could shoot. And the other big mistake that I made is I tried to force a photograph to happen because when I got to camp, I had my wide angle lens on my camera. So that's what I just grabbed and I went off into the scene with that wide angle. So I'm looking at this entire scene through a wide angle point of view. And I was trying to make a wide angle photograph happen when perhaps the conditions for wide angles weren't really there. And in retrospect, I suspect that if I could go back to that same spot, and with a mid-range or a telephoto lens, I could probably find some really interesting abstract or intimate scenes that would be a lot more successful than trying to force these wide-angle photographs to happen. Now, if you're looking at this photo and thinking, well, if you had some better light, that might actually be kind of epic. Well, maybe, because light can be a crutch. You know, you see so many 
shit photos out there that look good because they have really nice light in them. But for me, the mark of a truly talented photographer is somebody who can read the scene, read the light that exists and respond to it appropriately and create interesting photographs with the conditions that he or she has right there in front of him. If your MO is to set a composition up that succeeds or fails entirely depending on the light, which is something that you have no control over that may or may not happen, that is a recipe for disappointment, you guys. And to show you that good light doesn't immediately make a good photo, let's jump over to a shoot that I did at Mono Lake a couple of months ago. This was one of those sunsets that you could just tell was going to be bonkers. There were these deep, textured clouds off to the east and a very nice open slot to the west. And in fact, before the sunset actually occurred, the sun was just lasering through that break in the clouds and illuminating the tufa with this almost excruciating brilliance. And there were lots of birds around as well. There were gulls and ospreys and these little dudes that I don't know the name of. And I was just having a blast shooting all of them handheld with my telephoto lens. Now I typically bring two bodies with me when I'm shooting. So closer to sunset, I set up one camera on a tripod with a wide angle lens and I started looking for compositions and I was shooting some long exposures and I was so sure that the light would blow up in the direction that I was pointed with that camera to the northeast that I didn't even bother looking for compositions out towards the sunset. Instead, I just left my second camera with the telephoto lens. I left it sitting on top of my backpack and I left my second tripod that I brought out there packed up. I didn't even bother to set it up. Instead, I just went off happily shooting these wide angle long exposures and it really was a lot of fun. But even when I started getting indications that the light was going to be really, really good to the west toward the sunset, I still didn't bother looking hard for compositions. I was being so lazy. I could have got my other tripod out and I could have set the camera up on it just in case. But no, for some reason, that night I had the mentality of if the light really blows up to the west, I'll just grab a telephoto snapshot of it. What was I thinking? Anyway, I'm sure you can guess exactly what happened next. The light to the west absolutely exploded in one of the most unique and mesmerizing spectacles that I have seen at Mono Lake. A column of ruby red light came shooting up from behind the mountains and splashed all over the clouds to the west. And at this point, I basically panicked. I didn't have a composition set up. I didn't even have my camera on the tripod and I didn't know how long this light beam was going to last. So I grabbed the telephoto lens and I started shooting frantically. And this is what my first shot looked like. It's an okay composition except for the fact that I've got this huge bush right down there in the front of the frame that's annoying and distracting and ugly. And the other problem that I was facing was I'm shooting telephoto lens handheld near sunset. So I'm trying to keep the shutter speed high so I have a relatively sharp shot, which meant I opened up my ISO and I opened up my aperture. So now I've got basically no depth of field and I've got a lot of grain starting to creep into the photograph. But at this point, my reptile brain had basically taken over my conscious mammal brain and instead of getting out my tripod and actually trying to create a shot with good camera technique, I just went leaping off trying to capture this spectacle in some way. So my next shot, I basically got around this bush and shot some basic two-dimensional grab shots of the light beam. And these are fine, they're exposed well, and they're full of color, and that's great. But this shot has absolutely no depth to it. It's very documentary as opposed to any kind of artistic photograph. Uh, so I took a step back. I tried to recompose on those tufa and, and use them to a little bit of a kind of a framing element. And so I ended up shooting a composition like this, and I actually like this composition okay. It got rid of that annoying bush down in the front of the frame and some other distractions. It's just got the simple elements, the tufa, the lake, the mountain, the sunset. It's kind of everything that I wanted to have in the photograph. But look at my settings for this photo. I was at f5.6 
and 86 millimeters. And if you zoom in on this photo, there is no part of it that's sharp at all. And from a technical standpoint, where that light beam comes up from behind the mountain was incredibly bright. Orders of magnitude stops and stops brighter than the rest of the photo. So with the raw file, I underexposed this quite a lot to capture the full dynamic range. But since I was shooting at ISO 160 and I underexposed it by maybe two or three stops, that's actually more like shooting at ISO 640 or 1280. And so there's grain in the photo. And, and as I said, no part of the photo is sharp. It's super grainy. And I also didn't take into account the motion of the water. Perhaps this photo would have been better with a nice long exposure to smooth out the lake, to create some contrast between the Tufa Towers and the water. Plus, I think that would have created this beautiful syrupy ooze of color across the bottom of the frame. But I didn't do any of those things. Instead, I just sat there like a slack-jawed yokel with drool running out of both sides of my mouth and a telephoto lens trying to get this photograph. And then 40 seconds later, that light beam disappeared and my opportunity to get a decent photo of this spectacular phenomenon was totally lost. Now, thankfully, the night wasn't a total bust. The sky did turn beautiful pinks and blues to the northeast, and a number of those wide-angle long exposure shots that I was doing, they came out pretty well. But it still hurts a bit, well, actually a lot, when I look at this light beam, and I think of how I squandered the opportunity to photograph this very special thing in a meaningful way. So the biggest mistakes that I committed in this particular shoot, the first one was simply not being prepared. I wasn't actively looking for compositions in a direction, even though it was dead clear that the light was gonna be beautiful, even if that light beam hadn't showed up, the light was gonna be beautiful in that direction. Why wasn't I scouting for compositions? I was so fixated on this sure thing that I had with the wide angle long exposures that I didn't even bother looking around. I was also being so lazy, and honestly, that one I can't even explain it. I just didn't want to take my tripod out, and instead I was putting way too much trust in my gear, like relying on vibration reduction and relying on my full frame sensor to give me a nice clean result. Instead, what I should have been doing is relying on good camera technique, taking the five seconds to get the tripod out, put the camera on there, of choose an appropriate depth of field for the scene to get the effect that I want, a nice shutter speed, low ISO to get that good image quality as well as the water motion that I wanted to see in the lake. I have no excuse for why I was being that lazy. So yeah, all I can say is the more prepared you are, the better shots you're gonna take. The less lazy you are, the better shots you're gonna take. If I can pass along any message from this video, it's simply that. Give yourself the time, be prepared, put in the effort to do things right, and you're gonna be rewarded with good photographs. Alrighty, that's gonna do it for this video. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, comment, share with your friends, all that stuff. It tells YouTube to show this video to more people, which helps me grow the channel and make more videos. I really do appreciate it. This is JC signing off, so until next time, have fun and happy shooting.